Thank you for joining us. My name is Shimon Ben David, Phil CTO for Weka.io. Today we wanted to discuss the future of storage and compute in data centers, along with the technical and business drivers for these uh, transformations. And with me are two very experienced figures that have seen the change throughout the years and uh, are willing to share their experience. So um, first is Mark Hamilton, VP Solutions Architecture at NVIDIA, and Darren Johnson, Director of Technical Marketing at NVIDIA. Mark, would you like to take a few minutes and introduce yourself? Sure, thank you, Shimon. Uh, I, I don't know if very experienced just means gray hair or, or not. I'm not sure what you're trying to say, but you know, I run all of NVIDIA's uh, field engineering, so I'm responsible for all of our uh, products across networking and across data center in, in GPUs. And you know, today when, uh, when we think about uh, computing, we think about it at, at data center scale, right? And, and, and that's everything that we do. And so the networking, the storage, the compute, uh, we think about those, all of those together and how to optimize the solution. So that's a little bit what we'll be talking about today and how those components have really changed over time and morphed into a, a data center based approach to computing. Great, thank you. Uh, Darren, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for including me in this webinar. Uh, one of the things that, that my hope is to, to take away from today is really how there's been a, a tremendous transformation, uh, not only in the industry uh, around computing, but also how that computing is being used. And I think today, uh, I hope there's some really good insights on that. Thanks, Shimon. That's great. Thank you. So um, actually talking about that, Mark, Darren, you, you've actually both been in the industry for many years. Mark, you worked at HP and Sun. Darren, uh, you were at uh, Sun and Oracle. Um, and if we look back uh, 20 years ago, what were the business requirements? How were they different uh, than today? Obviously a lot of change. Uh, Mark, would you like uh, to say a few words? Boy, 20 years ago, I, I had to think how far back th that was. And, and so that was that was right about uh, uh, your 2K, Y2K. And, and when I think about what was going on then, right, is, is people were moving in part because of, of this sort of uh, your 2K challenge with, with software. People were moving from, you know, large mainframes to, to large uh, Unix systems, right? And in storage, storage was all about uh, DASD, right? There's a name for it. A direct attached uh, storage device in in uh, in storage was was local to uh, the server and, and of course uh, you know some of the most famous uh, storage companies in the world grew up in, in that market and and developed great solutions. Um, if you move forward ten years to sort of uh, ten years ago, it was really we saw the the start of what might be called uh, the cloud era, right? In in the cloud era had, had a couple of things, right? One what was the, that concept of, of computing in the cloud, but the architecture of the cloud, right? A, a cloud native architecture was the so-called hyperscale architecture, right? You, you were scaling out versus trying to scale up. And so when, when you scale out, a direct attached storage was, was less important, right? And we saw the evolution of network attached storage. And same thing, right? Like there were, were, were great storage companies founded in that day of direct attached storage. You saw a whole new class of storage companies emerge that really focused on network attached storage. And, and so that was a, a big development. Today, uh, today the, the biggest trend in, in IT, right, is is around is is still often done in the cloud, but also on prem, right? You hear the term hybrid multi cloud, right? What what CIO doesn't want to have a a hybrid multi cloud uh, strategy? But but the workload, the biggest most challenging workload that, that a modern day company has and, and wants to address is 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 AI, artificial intelligence, and and, and AI really requires requires more of, of a, a high performance computing approach uh, to storage. And I would say if you characterize really all of the advancements in storage today that, that are being done, it, it really is around software defined storage. And, and that software defined storage lets you put the storage uh, where you want, where you need it, and have still th that high performance access to it that, that is combines both that sort of scale out in, in that scale up type of approach. So software defined storage, um, really the term of the day. 
Interesting insight. So de definitely looking back 20 years ago, Y2K and then the cloud era. Um, and then as you mentioned, a lot of storage companies evolving through that era and software defined storage emerging. Uh, Darren, what, what's your view on uh, how the business uh, requirements changed during that the last years? Absolutely. And just to add to, to kind of what Mark has talked about, um, if we look at the data um, that was uh, being consumed or used um, back then, we talked about um, maybe megabytes and, and gigabytes. Um, today, we're transitioning to terabytes and even petabytes and even exabytes, depending on the, the industry that you're in. So there's been a tremendous transition from uh, then to now in terms of data. But if you look then at the data, um, how do you consume that data? Um, having a few cores and and twice about integration. It's about bringing things uh, together, about leveraging the technology so you can get the data where you need it, when you need it. Information is around um, the internet. Um, and it's not just about our ability to consume the, the internet. It's about the data being generated by the internet. Uh, whether it's your your uh, uh, internet connected devices in your house are generating data, whether you're using amazon.com to buy things, data is being generated, autonomous vehicles, all these things are being connected together. You look at cellular, 5G, huge amounts of data, but how do you consume it? How do you have the data wh where you need it? How do you um, combine the high performance networking, the storage, to feed the, the AI that Mark talked about. And, and I think that's the, the, the biggest transformation. It's about the integration, it's about the data, it's about the acceleration. It's amazing, it's, it's funny because now that you mention it, I remember uh, 20 years ago or even a bit where everybody, it was the e-environment, e right? The internet was just blasting and um, there was discussions that everything will be eventually connected, your fridge, your shoe. Your, your watch, right? And, and we're, we're there now and we're generating massive amounts of data. Um, and then as you mentioned, and you and Mark mentioned, going through that data is, is one of the main uh, business changes. So, so now what we actually see is that um, going through what was the domain of the HPC environments in the past is now starting to seep into the enterprises. Um, so, so thanks for that. Um, I think at this point we'll, we'll have our first poll question uh, that will just pop up on your screen. Um, kind of like elaborating a bit on this poll question while we'll continue the discussion. Um, it, it's really interesting to understand uh, the workloads that you guys are seeing, that attendees are seeing in your organization, whether they're, um, whether they're in the cloud or on-prem or um, what type of workload is it? Uh, do you see AI workloads with image data or voice data? And the last two options, which are also really interesting, but a bit technical, is what's your uh, file sizes? Um, I'll explain that a bit. Um, we see in multiple AI and ML environments uh, where there are massive amounts of data. Some of these data points could be um, recordings of um, images or, or videos. Some of these could be uh, even massive amounts of text files. Um, so it's really interesting to see the file sizes that you see in your organizations, whether they're uh, massive files or whether they're even small uh, oriented files. And, and that uh, poll question will remain there for a few seconds while we continue. So um, Darren, uh, still looking back, how was legacy infrastructure designed 20 years ago? Yeah, I think that the, the key thing to look at it 20 years ago is that you had discrete workloads. Um, you had your CRM system, you had your accounting system, maybe you had your HR system. They're all kind of discrete, separate from each other. They, they typically would have their dedicated server and, and maybe some redundancy and the servers would be at 30% utilization and the, the data that is associated with that, that particular workload or that function would be on the system where the, as Mark mentioned, direct attached storage. You certainly didn't, didn't have the cloud in, in, in any meaningful way. So it was even harder to share if you had to share between different data centers and different geographies, you really had to be super sensitive uh, around what data you, you transmitted because it, it was just a challenge. But I think that uh, aside from the le legacy infrastructure was the, the methods used to, to enable those infrastructures. Um, you had armies of, of people programming 
um, highly structured code and testing and verifying and, and uh, kind of uh, with no integration. Um, and you weren't necessarily maximizing the data. Yes, you had your, your spreadsheets and you could do the analysis or you could check your financials, but there was no integration. And, and I think one of the transitions and we talk about kind of going from the old to the new is with AI that changes that. You, you have the computers doing the program. You have the data that you're, you're, you're gathering uh generating the programming and, and that requires a fundamentally different approach than the the kind of the, the historical um technology uh, technology infrastructure and you needed the ability to now you need the ability to just kind of bring all those things together um and again i think that's why we're here talking today about how, how the technology is tightly integrated so you can maximize it because those GPU servers, you don't want running at 30% utilization. You want them running at 95% utilization. But to do that, you need to think about the infrastructure. That, that's interesting. So you, you raise a few great points. So uh, infrastructure definitely changed a lot over the last 20 years. And I think you also alluded to uh, the fact that uh, software frameworks were much more structured in the past. So uh, structured databases, while um, moving forward, it, it seems to be uh, a lot of more unstructured data. Um, so Mark, given the differences between legacy workloads and modern workloads, how does today data center looks like? Again, uh, the way a data center looks today that's running uh, modern AI workloads, if, if you think about it, um, it, the simplest sense, the way to think about AI is it's software that writes software. Right, and, and there's nothing magic about it, right? But what is, is required is lots of data, right? Instead of, of a human sitting down and typing at, at the computer, at the keyboard, uh, you still have a developer, but that developer is taking, you know, terabytes, petabytes of data and feeding it into a, a deep neural network, uh, feeding it into a, a machine learning algorithm. And then, you know, out the other end is, is popping out a uh, code. Uh, sometimes those processes take a very long time, right? Uh, to train a, a state of the art, a natural language understanding algorithm <coughs> network like GPT-3. Uh, we use uh, our entire superpod, over 1000 NVIDIA GPUs, uh, it takes about 60 days to train the GPT-3 1,175 billion parameter model. So think about that. You, you have a program that runs for uh, 60 days. Uh, obviously, if it, if it fails at day 59, you don't want to throw away all of your results. So you have to do uh, checkpointing along the way. And, and that checkpointing ends up being, can be a substantial amount, right? Double digit uh, amount of the total <coughs> of the total wall clock for doing uh, the compute. So it's important then to have that that high performance storage for uh, the checkpointing, right? Just a different uh, type of workload that you're doing. So when we look at, at the data center, right, the traditional way might be to say, well, let's just look at our data center. Uh, let's look at the, the network utilization. Right. Oh, we've got an Ethernet network and it's running 20 percent utilized. And, and, you know, when it gets to 25 percent utilized, uh, we, we know we have to start thinking about adding uh, more Ethernet switches. Right. Uh, you, you can't you can't today look at a scale up architecture and, and design it one component at a time. Right. We're designing supercomputers for AI. Right, our, our DGX SuperPod is, is a great example. And we design it as a complete supercomputer, right? And, and people say, well, what if, I, what if I put in a slightly different CPU? Or what if I put in a little bit less networking? Or what if I put in you know, a, a different type of storage? Uh, won't it work just as well, right? And uh, it might, uh, we don't know. But, uh, but what we're doing is, is we're building that full solution as a reference architecture. And then uh, we publish that out uh, to all of our partners. And, uh, and, and we invite our storage partners, of course, to go through and then work with us to build a similar uh, reference architectures by fitting their storage into it. And then we test out that whole thing and, and, and we certify it 
is a reference architecture and we maintain it. And then when we change the software six months down the road, we make sure to go back and retest it, right? And we could we consider a, a performance regression a bug. And, and you can't do that when when you're you're just looking at it component by component. So I think is is designing your entire infrastructure uh, data center is the new unit of consumption, right? I'm not buying independently servers and storage and, and networking. You have to look at how all the components work together. I think that's massive. That's, uh, that's a great insight. So, so now consuming data centers instead of uh, um, let's just buy compute or let's just buy storage and, and let's try to make it work together. You're saying let's, let's uh, uh, look at the whole solution holistically at what it needs to do and provide and, and, and go with a pre-checked, pre-tested reference architecture. I think you also mentioned a bit of, uh, of ML ops. Uh, operations, checkpointing uh, workloads that are running for a long time. And that's interesting because we um, started touching that pr topic previously with the convergence of HPC and, and AI workloads, uh, definitely in supercomputer centers. Um, checkpointing was kind of like the domain of long running HPC jobs where you had like an end-to-end -end or an end-to-one checkpointing. And, and you see that now also in AI, which is I think it's amazing. Fast forward a bit uh, to recent days uh, with an outlook to the future. So Darren, NVIDIA recently made an announcement about Magnum IO. Uh, can you talk a bit about it and, and the future of compute uh, according to NVIDIA? Absolutely, happy to. Um, Magnum IO is actually a, a bundle of a, a bunch of different technologies, um, nickel for inter-GPU communication. But I think the, the one piece that people like to talk about is, is GPU direct storage. It's the ability to take data directly from storage and put it in the GPU. Um, and why is that different than, than what it was before? Um, before you had to copy data to the CPU memory and then you would copy it to the GPU. This takes the CPU out of the equation. Um, and, and what does that do? Uh, it does a couple of things. One is it, it speeds up the process. You're not doing what we call a B copy, which, which takes time and introduces latency. So, so you just don't have to do that. Plus you're not putting any stress or, 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 or utilization of the CPU, which then leaves the CPU to do other things. Um, whether it's managing uh, non-optimized, GPU optimized, other key piece other than kind of reducing utilization of the CPU is uh, throughput. Um, GPs are hungry. Um, some of the workloads, they, they, they need tremendous amounts of data, whether it's an HPC workload, a, a pro visualization workload, or an AI workload, they want to consume lots of data. So now you kind of take, 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 uh, make the pipe as big as you want and you, you feed the system. And in fact, I, I believe we demonstrated recently with Weka that we were able to drive 162 gigabytes, not gigabits, but 162 gigabytes um, per second to a single DGX A100. That's massive, that's massive. Um, in, in the past, you would talk about one gigabit or two gigabits or maybe a few gigabytes, but basically you, you, you've enabled the system to consume data as fast as it needs it. And why is that important? Well, if you're doing a visualization of a simulation of a Mars demo in which you have uh, 150, 500 terabytes of data and you need to stream that into a system, that's critical. Whether you're transmitting 100 gigabytes to 300 gigabytes of a whole genome sequence into a system, you don't want the bottleneck. So GPU direct storage, it really enables that. And again, the CPUs are, are left to manage um, uh, the rest of the system. Um, so you don't have that bottleneck. And I think, I mean, the, the, the key takeaway is um, really our partnerships are about re removing bottlenecks, providing the, the GPUs to, to do these AI workloads that are compute intensive, um, building solutions or, or systems around those that are highly optimized, leveraging the, the latest in networking technology. But because when you're talking about trying to feed 162 gigabytes um, a second into single system, you need 200 gigabit InfiniBand, you need 200 gig, gigabit Ethernet, you need multiples of those in a system, and then you need the storage to drive it. 
um, you can't use kind of traditional storage to, to drive that much throughput. Either you don't have the capacity or you don't have the, the, the bandwidth or the IOPS. Um, and so it's, it's, it's some great technology that just kind of starts bringing uh, a lot of things together. And again, removing the bottlenecks. Now, I think one of the important things is, is that, that we, NVIDIA, can't do it alone. And it's really about a, a partnership, uh, whether it's uh, with our networking folks or systems folks, but with invaluable port uh, storage partners such as, as WACA. And I think in, in that context, um, Shimon, why don't you talk a little bit about um, the, the, the joint RA that, that we've released and some of the work that we've done around GDS? Wow, switching the tables. Uh, that's great. So, um, so yeah, thanks for mentioning that. So we, we did do um, uh, the joint array, the reference architecture um, that uh, certifies Weka on the DGX pod, as well as the GPU direct storage certification. Um, I, I would like to reiterate actually some of the points that you mentioned. So first of all, regarding the array, um, we, we already have multiple GPU servers. Um, solutions and customers deployed in the field and that's really interesting and it's we, we constantly learn about how our customers are using it uh, we look at gpu direct storage as, as definitely the next evolution of uh, of um, getting the performance out of your um, storage or eventually it's all about as you mentioned it's all about getting insights from your data the storage is an enabler the, the gpu is an enabler uh, your time to, to output to insight is, is what's important. So you never want, to, or, or I would say it a bit differently, you always want to move the bottleneck as farther as you can. So suddenly you have these massive GPUs, they can compute massive amounts of data, they have uh, massive amounts of memory, you want to feed them uh, fast enough, you want to make sure that the storage is not a, a bottleneck for that. GPU direct storage allows you to do that, whether it's uh, throughput, whether it's IOPS, or massive amounts of metadata, all are required um, from our perspective, and GPU Direct Storage allows that. Uh, I would say that um, we, we started by talking also about uh, Magnum IO, um, but um, what we see is that the work NVIDIA did all around uh, enabling the ease of management, ease of use for uh, customers uh, by the NGC, deploying multiple containers, getting up and running as easily as possible, and start working with your data as fast as possible is, is really uh, impressive. Talking about RA, our uh, GPU direct storage number. So I think you mentioned we were able to feed uh, 162 gigabyte per second per um, DGXA100, um, definitely showing that uh, you were able to get, um, the storage will not be a bottleneck to any computation that it will require to do. We, alongside that, we also were able to show 43 million ops uh, a million of these were IOPS, the rest were metadata ops, again, to that single DGX server, which shows also um, varying workload would be accommodated uh, as needed. So, um, so I think um, that's regarding uh, GPU direct storage. Um, I think we have another poll question right now. Um, where are you on your GPU journey? Uh, that should now pop up on our screen. And that's interesting. And I'm for, for our attendees, if you saw our previous uh, webinar about the state of AI, um, these, th th these are all interesting questions um, that are intended to see um, where are you as customers within your AI journey? Are you already in it? Did you start? Are you planning to start? Uh, and definitely we see different customers also in different stages. Uh, maybe piloting, maybe on their initial um, batch of GPU servers. And we also see customers with thousands of GPUs. So that's definitely interesting to learn where uh, are you. And also feel free to, to add um, to the chat what challenges do you see. So, hey, Shimon. Uh, yeah. Shimon, uh, I've got actually a comment on, on the poll question because I absolutely love that, that question. And I think it's super relevant. Um, and the message to everybody on the phone is if you're not kind of on your GPU journey, if you're not on your AI journey, um, frankly, your competitors are. Um, there is not an industry that I've seen 
that doesn't have an element of AI or HPC or the combination of the two or, or analytics. Um, in many, if not all aspects of, of the, um, uh, of, of the business. And in fact, I think, uh, Shimon, maybe you can talk in, in a second about some of the survey results about, um, that, that you see not only all these industries that are adopting AI, but they're adopting different uh, aspects of it, whether it's recommender systems, uh, video analytics, um, obviously uh, machine learning, um, that, that they're all doing it. And, and I think that if you're not on your journey, get on your journey. If you don't know um, kind of how to get started, the, NVIDIA has tremendous number of resources to get, get started. Um, if you're getting on your, your starting on your journey, or even if you're on your journey, think about your infrastructure, think about where your data is, think about how you're gonna bring it together and then build that infrastructure um, to, to maximize the value of the data, maximize the value of the data scientists that, that you've employed to, to do this. Look at the, uh, the thousands of startups out there that may have the technology that can fast track you to getting that, the uh, insights that you need to, to accelerate your business, to gain greater insight in your customers, to gain, to accelerate your business processes, et cetera, and, and maximize value. And, and also think about how you can monetize your data and, and leverage it, not only for your own use, but maybe there's, there's a way to leverage that data for other people. So I think getting on your journey is uh, super, super important. Sorry, Shimon, for interrupting. No, no, that's a really good interrupt and I'll interrupt your interruption by saying um, an additional <laughs> point. Um, we, we see GPUs, AI, and machine learning. I, I, I constantly emphasize uh, when talking with uh, people, AI and ML are often done on GPUs, but GPUs can do so much more. Um, so we, we talked about the convergence of HPC and AI. Uh, some of that are um, AI machine learning models predicting um, HPC simulations, thereby decreasing the amount of simulations. But some of that are HPC workloads that just simply change the math to work on GPUs. So GPUs have a massive amounts of processors. Why not use that? So I think what I'm saying is that not, when thinking about GPUs, not all GPU workloads are AI and ML. So GPUs, we, we have been known to, we have seen multiple workloads that are actually leveraging GPUs for their raw power, for example, uh, the NVIDIA Clara Parabricks uh, environment, um, the, the GATK pipeline on uh, uh, running on GPUs or some uh, GPU accelerated ETL engine, analysis engines uh, in financials. So, there, and there's many more examples. So um, some GPUs are AI ML, some are being used for different uh, ways. And definitely if you're not doing it, your competitors are, and um, you, you wanna make sure that they don't have a leg up on you. Um, so, Mark, Darren, let's talk a bit about the future now. Um, yeah, Shimon, um, I mean, speaking of the future and kind of related to the topics that, that we've been talking about, um, I, I've noticed that uh, Weka has kind of shifted gears and kind of, I'll say, rebranded itself from being a file system to data platform. And, and that's particularly intriguing to me because we've talked about the importance of the data and the importance of kind of going from a, a legacy approach to, to, uh, to modernizing it. Tell me about what the data platform is. Wow, great question. Um, so, so, so I completely agree. We've gone from the legacy approach of, hey, uh, Weka is a file system. Uh, use it for storage to, um, it, we now see what it completely enables our customers. So the way we see it, storage should be another component in your solution. I think as Mark mentioned, you don't buy a storage or a compute, you buy a data center, you buy a solution. So storage should be just another component in the solution that actually enable the workload or your pipeline, or whatever that can be, in, and that could be in many uh, multiple applications. Uh, and it, more often, it should actually be in a utility model. So it will not bottleneck any workflow in terms of uh, capacity. So you can get a uh, limitless capacity. Uh, you will never just not be able to run something because you ran out of uh, storage capacity, but also in performance. So uh, you need to make sure that it can accommodate for varying workloads. But you also, in, in another aspect that sometimes it's neglected until it's really um, painful is the management aspect. You wanna make sure that you, you can 
manage that environment, these petabytes or exabytes of data that are now uh, sipping into the organizations um, in, in a very simple way, because you want to make sure that your organization, your, your analyst, analytics, analysts, uh, your data scientists, uh, your programmers are now focusing on the business objective and not on uh, managing the storage or tweaking it or tuning it. So um, that's where we see the data platform uh, coming into effect. So we also see a massive shift uh, to containerized environments, uh, Kubernetes, Docker, there's a few more. Uh, and, and we think storage should be similar. Definitely software defined storage uh, should enable that. So imagine that uh, similar to how you provision a container, you could provision additional storage. Uh, maybe that would be also containerized somewhere. So there, there's a shift for um, storage being a utility, uh, a limitless utility. Um, and um, additionally, what we see is that, and we hear it more and more, definitely with this new connected world, you, you mentioned uh, networking between, networking increasing between organization, within the data center, between data centers. So we wanna make sure that um, your storage does not lock your data into a box or an appliance or even a data center. Uh, you want to make sure that it allows the agility of moving it around as needed. Um, between different locations. So if you need the data on a data center, uh, or maybe you want to burst to another data center to a private or a, even a public cloud, uh, your storage should enable that. So, so that's what we do with the um, Limitless Data Platform. We were able to expand and move the data and protect it. Um, definitely the amounts of data that modern organization acquire um, makes it hard to, to look at past technologies uh, and perform that. So um, there are a lot of environments that are suitable to moving some amounts of data between different locations. But with what we see is that with petabytes of data, billions of files that are now required or are being used in these environments, um, they're less effective. So having the ability of the file system of the, of the Weka environment to do that internally, to manage that data movement, actually enables uh, that in a way that, uh, frankly, see, we see some of our customers that had challenges with that and were not um, able to do that. And, and finally, and I will reiterate it because we're super excited about it and um, GPU data, um, GPU direct storage. Uh, so I'm, uh, providing the ability to, to have the performance on that data. So you have massive amounts of data. Uh, with the Weka Limitless data platform. You're able to move it around through our environment. You you're able to manage it in a very simple way. Uh, the ability to, to crunch that data, to analyze that data in a fast and efficient way is um, really super important. And then the last topic I think I will mention on that is that um, the, in many organizations, we saw that uh, backing up and DRing the data is, is a challenge. Uh, that has been tackled in different ways. Again, our ability to move the data and make it available instantly on other locations, other data centers is, is crucial to that. Um, so thanks for that. So now back to the future, um, one, two, and three. Uh, Mark, NVIDIA and Mellanox uh, merged about a year ago. Um, how do you see that merger going to help shape the future of HPC and data centers? Well, you're right. We acquired Mellanox uh, last year. That, that acquisition closed. And so uh, it, it's been uh, just a, a natural evolution of our strategy, right, is, is we started to build uh, our own supercomputers for uh, NVIDIA's use, right? And you say, why does NVIDIA need a supercomputer, right? You, you're not, as far as we know, NVIDIA, you're not processing genomes or, or you're not you know, doing uh, other things that people traditionally do with a supercomputer. But again, uh, we have uh, we have we have thousands of AI developers at NVIDIA now, and, and they use that supercomputer or, or set of supercomputers every day to write software, right? And so so we uh, we started we started building supercomputers so that we could attract the world's best AI researchers to NVIDIA, and now we build bigger and faster supercomputers because we have more and more AI developers and they're using it in more and more industries, right? Uh, we have, for instance, uh, um, 
we've announced that we're building uh, the, ton the whole autonomous vehicle stack for, uh, for Mercedes-Benz. Every, every Mercedes-Benz car rolling off the lot starting in the 2024 model year will be driven, autonomously driven by the NVIDIA software. And so we have to write all of, of that software. So in doing that, we, we ended up building a bigger and bigger uh, supercomputers because often the turnaround time is important, right? When an engineer gets an idea and he says, well, what if I did this in the software, right? If you need to wait um, two months, to, to write the software, then the, the engineer is going to for, have forgotten about what he started with by then. Versus if you have to wait uh, two hours, right, and can get that result, then that engineer can experiment with, with four different things in, in a day, right? And so uh, as, as we built those supercomputers, right, we realized that it wasn't, it, it wasn't enough just to build the, the DGX as a reference platform. It became more and more important to actually build the entire supercomputer, including all of the networking. And we, we worked very early on so, since our first uh, supercomputer with Mellanox and then uh, eventually decided that it would be uh, it would be a great acquisition for uh, the company. So that acquisition is closed. It's integrated. Uh, you know, one of the unique things about Nvidia is is while we design the full data center, the full supercomputer, we let customers consume it in any way they want. If you want to buy our DGX SuperPod and have exactly the same supercomputer that our AI developers are you are using, uh, you can do that. If you want to uh, work with an OEM and buy a GPU supercomputer from the OEM and, and run the Weka data platform on it, uh, that's great. We let customers consume it that way. If you wanna, if you wanna go buy a GPU, if you're a, 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 if you're a student at a university, a researcher, and you wanna buy a, a consumer GPU and build your own PC around it, that's great. We, we let you do it that way. And then of course today, right, most startups start in the cloud. Right, and so it's important that, that our platform, our GPU platform, be available in, in in the cloud. Right, and so every every public cloud around the world has NVIDIA GPUs. And, and going back to to software defined storage, if that storage is part of your whole architecture, right? If your if your storage is not software defined, right? How do you get it in every cloud, right? And, and so that's the, the great. Uh, you know, uh, opportunity. And so again, uh, GPU direct storage, it, it's a little bit, you know, it's a not very well understood uh, technology, right? It's actually uh, under the, the Magnum IO uh, umbrella. It's a set of a number of different technologies, right? That accelerate that storage and accelerate the storage all the way from where the backing store, all the way through the supercomputer, all the way into the file system and ultimately into the application running on the, the GPU. And so that, if it's not software defined, right? GDS is software defined, right? You, you can't implement G GDS without having a, in effect software defined storage. And so again, some of the ways in which we see that whole uh, data center evolving today. Wow, that's great, thank you. So, uh, Darren, um, is the future of compute about more flexibility, speed, all of the above? Uh, it's, it's definitely all of the above. I, and I think a kind of an interesting kind of historical context, and, and this kind of dates me a little bit, uh, some of the first, uh, one of the first uh, supercomputer that um, I, I worked on was a Cray XMP. Uh, and to kind of put it in perspective, uh, back then, it, it had a massive performance of a 0.8 gigaflops, so floating point operations per second. Uh, fast forward today, and you look at a uh, PlayStation 5 um, that has 10 teraflops of performance. Yeah. But hey, we can't stop there. Um, we need uh, emerging technology such as uh, the, the Ampere GPU that uh, NVIDIA has or the DJXA100 um, that has eight of them, where you can get uh, five teraflops, or sorry, five petaflops uh, of, of performance out of that. But that implies um, a, a lot of things that it's not, because you have the compute doesn't mean that you can use it. 
um, you need to be able to, and I've talked about this, this uh, uh, throughout this conversation, um, you need the networking, you need um, the storage to be able to drive that and, and, and maximize that. You need to be able to, uh, I mean, aside from being on-prem, you need to, to have options. Uh, be in the cloud, uh, be on-prem, have a hybrid strategy in which um, you can do the compute where you need to, or you can burst to the cloud if you need to. Um, you have the ability to, to get the data when and where you need it. Is, is super, super critical. And having access to that GPU acceleration to drive higher performance of the workload, having that access to uh, the high performance storage and the networking to connect it is, is uh, so critical. And, but it turns out that if you bring those things together and you have the, the, the critical workloads, now you can do things that weren't previously possible making the impossible possible, having truly autonomous driving where you can trust your car to keep your family safe, where we can accelerate time to a vaccine or time to a treatment for COVID-19, which becomes so critical for literally the world. Um, we need to be able to, to enable that. And most importantly, we need to have access to, to great recommender systems. So when you go to Amazon or you go to your favorite uh, site and you're looking for that special Valentine's gift for your spouse, you get lots of great choices. So you don't have to guess. Definitely important. And these are all things that are super, super important. That's great. Definitely uh, making sure you get uh, the perfect Valentine gift is one of my favorites. Um, actually, I what you mentioned earlier, Darren, that uh, we kind of like did this uh, poll where we, we talked with uh, many uh, customers and, and saw where they are using uh, AI ML environment. So we actually got a really uh, interesting amount of results. Um, ju just for the sake of the sample, it's more than uh, uh, 1,100 results. So that's very encompassing. Um, and it's really interesting to see what AI and ML are being used for. So. Um, we saw, for example, recommender systems. So exactly what you mentioned, um, scientific visualization. I think we all imagine these uh, HPC centers going over massive amounts of data um, to visualize multiple components, chemicals, uh, gases, um, image recognition. So we're all familiar with uh, autonomous cars environments. Actually with Weka we work with, uh, and that's what we saw also, multiple cars, trucks, drones, um, so multiple uh, image recognition environment, image, re video, and more. Um, conversational AI, so call centers uh, or more. Um, cybersecurity, I think that was an interesting one. So AI environments are being used to analyze uh, security logs. Um, we now see that occurring also in near real-time environments. So that's massive, increasing your security through um, AI, AI and ML. Uh, and then one interesting one was transcoding. So we were kind of like uh, scratching our head. How does transcoding use uh, AI and ML? A and then it hits us. So we actually understood the use case. We talked with the, um, the, the customer. Um, you can use actually AI and ML to better schedule um, workloads across your environment. So imagine that you have a, a data center filled with uh, compute servers, uh, GPUs, CPUs, networking environments. Uh, and more often than not, you, you have a job scheduler, right? That would um, target these workloads across multiple environments. Um, you can use AI and ML, and we see that uh, in the transcoding environment where they, they are uh, using the AI ML environment to optimize the, the job scheduler. Um, so which jobs would run re where to, to get the best output uh, out of their environment. So I think that's massive, that's really interesting. Um, and obviously there's the breakdown of which uh, um, market, which organization type are using which type of uh, um, use cases. Um, and that's also interesting. So we'll be glad to share that with you also. Um, Mark, uh, before we conclude, any final words to our viewers? Well, you know, there was a, a question and I answered it in the chat about how do you find out what sort of applications uh, run today on, on GPUs? And so uh, one of the best kept secrets in, in, in NVIDIA is, is our software hub that we call uh, NGC. 
and they're very easy to find, ngc.nvidia.com. In there, we have uh, hundreds of different applications, right? Uh, most of them, some of them are written by NVIDIA, a few, but most of them are, are third-party AI frameworks or, or HPC applications, where we work with the developers of those applications to, to tune and optimize them on the NVIDIA GPU platform. Uh, we then uh, update NGC every 30 days with the, res with the combined result of, of over 18,000 NVIDIA engineers plus all the engineers in our partners. And then of, of course we test and optimize those applications on our own DGX SuperPod, but we also, uh, we also work with OEMs. All the major OEMs have now NGC optimized uh, configurations or NGC certified configurations. And then we work with all of the public clouds. So for instance, the AWS marketplace has direct access to uh, NGC. And, and again, uh, almost all of those applications, all the, all the NVIDIA ones are almost all uh, free. There are some third party applications on there as well, almost like a, an app store, but sort of say where you can download uh, demo versions of them. So I definitely encourage people to uh, check out uh, NGC. And, and again, uh, the, the advantage of, of having uh, reference architectures uh, with, with NVIDIA and Weka is that if you're running that reference architecture and you're running an NGC application and, and you notice uh, any sort of issue, performance issue or, or others, uh, Weka and NVIDIA will work to resolve those together. That's great. Thanks for that. So. I think uh, I'll summarize what we talked about in the last uh, 15 minutes. Uh, organization definitely changed massively. The business requirements and the um, technical aspects of organization changed in the last 20 or definitely more years. Um, we went from scale up, scale down to scale out, cloud, uh, from buying different components, as Mark mentioned, to, to buying multiple data centers. Uh, as Darren mentioned, network has, has been unleashed on the organization. So we went from megabits to single gigabits to, to now 10, 200 and more gigabits per second networking that really enables cross communication. And now GPUs are um, massively being distributed to, to increase the compute. The compute power is actually an enabler for organization to take better decision, better real time decision. Um, we also want to, to make sure that the storage is never the bottleneck in these environments and actually the storage is an enabler. Um, so we mentioned the Weka limitless data platform, um, st storage performance is one aspect of it um, in all aspects, right? Throughput, apps, met latency and metadata, but also the data mobility, the ability to move the data. Um, Mark, you mentioned cloud, definitely um, cloud, on-prem, private, public, uh, and also the ease of management. Uh, we see that as, as a huge point. I did refer to a report that we we, we did, uh, a survey that we created, the state of AI, uh, by, by going to multiple customer organizations and uh, understanding what their usage, and we quoted some, um, some of the answers. Um, definitely, if you'd like to receive the full report, we'll be glad to share it. And uh, definitely, we'll also share the recording of uh, this session today. Uh, across uh, with additional resources um, over the next few days. I'd like to thank Mark and Darren a lot for joining me in this uh, session. And uh, thank you very much.